This virtual conversation as part of the BSA Medical Sociology pandemic event for 2020. Uh, my name is Catherine Polk and I'm currently chair of the SHI editorial board and I'm also a professor of medical sociology at the University of Oxford. We've put together this session to highlight the Sociology of Health and Illness virtual special issue featuring past papers on race and ethnicity research. This collection of papers, which are all free to access, showcases the work that medical sociologists and researchers have done in recent years on these topics. It's a diverse collection and I encourage you to take a look at it if you haven't already done so. The virtual issue and today's event were inspired by recent calls for more anti-racist practice in our communities, provoked by the murder of George Floyd, just one of too many murders and examples of racist violence, and these are not limited to the USA, but also by wider conversations about justice, equality and activism that we've been having on the editorial board in the BSA and the MedSoc group and in our work and home lives. Today, we're going to have a conversation about just two of the papers in the SHI collection on race and ethnicity. And I'm going to be really honest, I picked these two papers because they affected me and selfishly, I wanted to chat to the authors. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to read the papers and the others in the issue and let's extend the discussion that we have on these really important topics. This is the first time we've had this kind of conversation or event at MedSoc, so bear with us. Like so much in these turbulent COVID-19 pandemic times, this is new, but we hope that you enjoy finding out more about the two papers. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Andrew Smart and Tarek Yunus to our conversation. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Andy to just say a little bit about who you are. Okay, well, thanks very much for uh, for inviting me, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be involved in this. So uh, my name's uh, Andy Smart, and I'm a reader in sociology at Bath Spa University. And I have a kind of long-standing interest in race and ethnicity and how it intersects with biomedical science. So I've you know I've, I've published work in uh, science and technology studies journals, but also in uh, um, health, uh, sociology of health and journals as well. Thanks, Andy. And Tarek, a bit about you. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, Catherine, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Tarek Yunus. I'm a lecturer at uh, Middlesex University. And my, uh, my research interests very broadly cover uh, race and culture, um, and particularly politics and mental health settings. Um, I've been very interested in, in, in these intersections for a very long time. Um, and uh, the paper I'll be presenting later comes from my British Academy Fellowship, um, which I, where I was exploring uh, particularly the significance of politics in, um, in mental health settings. Thanks, Tarek. Okay, so I'm going to ask some specific questions um, about your papers. Um, and I'll start with Andrew, uh, Andy. Um, your paper co-authored with Kate Viner about rad uh, racialized prescribing was something that I turned to alongside a TED talk by Dorothy Roberts, uh, where she talks about the problem with race-based medicine. And she talks about how the project of medicine, research and practice is both racialized and racist. And your paper takes a topological approach to focus on questions of how racialized populations are materialized. And you use this lovely case study of clinical practice guidelines for hypertension in England and Wales. And these clinical practice guidelines are based on a prescribing algorithm that differentiates by age and race ethnicity and underpins NICE guidance that was issued in 2006 and then revised in uh, 2011. And I'll be really honest, it had not occurred to me before reading your paper to think about how NICE guidelines are varied by race. But, this, but of course they do that, but it, I just, you provoked me to think about that. And you used documentary analysis and expert interviews to walk us through how guidelines racialize prescribing. 
and I thought we'd just take a little bit of time to focus on the 11 semi-structured expert interviews that you did. Can you tell me a bit more about those and particularly how the experts that you interviewed problematize racialized prescribing? Uh, sure. Uh, I think it warrants noting that the the expert interviews included a kind of a range of practitioners from a, a you know from different health expertise backgrounds, um, including clinicians, but they weren't exclusively clinicians. Uh, but it also included some of the people who were involved in drafting the various uh, nice guidelines. So we did, you know, we did. Um, um, a purposive sampling of experts and some snowball sampling from that to try and get some people who kind of really knew their way through the guidelines and perhaps what the implications of the guidelines would be. And I think one of the interesting findings is that these people didn't tend to see race in particularly problematic terms or perhaps when they were engaging with the interview maybe they were minimizing the problems that they saw uh, that they had experienced through uh, through the processes um, but you know when we look at the guideline uh, the development there were a couple of respondents who were you know directly involved in the guideline uh, development and they specifically said that problems relating to race weren't actually uh, that great the problems that they did acknowledge were about language and terminology so that's the words that should be used to describe uh, the population groups. So what we did, we looked at various stakeholder response documents that NICE had on its website to see if we could see what the problems were. And, and when we looked at those, we could see that what had happened is that the, uh, the, the people who drafted the guidelines had sent out the initial draft, which had recommended treatment, a treatment pathway specifically for black patients. And the stakeholder organizations from a whole range of positions, clinical professionals, health charities, academics, uh, industry, all asked, you know, what what does that mean? Who in practice counts as being black? Does that include South Asian patients? Does it include mixed race patients? So there was this kind of uncertainty about what that term actually meant uh, in practice. And so what was quite interesting about the interviews was that um, uh, you know, the interviews with the people who are involved in drafting the guidelines, was that their uh, reactions to this response about the language, you know, if we read between the lines a little bit, was, was basically seemed to be that of frustration or uh, annoyance. So one said, you know, said he, he had almost lost the will to live, uh, and another talked about, you know, political correctness. So there was this sense that, um, you know, the... the uh, the problems that other people were seeing in the language weren't the problems that they were recognised in trying to draft guidelines about clinical practice. And they seemed to position NICE, you know, the, the, the arm of state bureaucracy, the, the organisation responsible for ironing out these problems in terminology. So the stakeholder response document then kind of went on to respond to all these you know, stakeholders and say that the standardised Office of National Statistics categories Will what will be used for the guidance rather than this vague thing, uh, black patients. In the end, the guidance said black patients are those of African or Caribbean descent, not mixed race Asian or Chinese patients. So, you know, I had gone into these interviews expecting that people might talk that race is a problematic idea for science, maybe have them, you know, critically evaluate the various studies that have been done or, you know, reflect on whether it was okay to use mainly US data for British patients. But none of those none of those things came out. And you know, perhaps the lack of you know congruence between my perception of the problem and their perception of the problem, you know, is part of the issue itself. That dividing populations by race is a socially entrenched straight thing. It draws on common sense, ideas about difference, it draws on institutional practices from state bureaucracy, and it draws on a really long history uh, of science. So that kind of incongruence, I think, was quite interesting because also then when I asked people about you know, what would be the problems for clinical practice, there was a similar lack of spontaneous concern. So, you know, we asked, we had to kind of then you know, push a bit to find out areas that we thought there might be problems, you know, if they also thought those might be problems. So we used these kind of breaching questions. We asked about how they might deal with specific uh, cases. So, you know, where 
where the guidelines had used the phrase black patients are those of African or Caribbean descent, we asked about how they might deal with mixed race patients or North African patients. And, you know, some people would start then talking about why there might be difficulties in categorising those people. But even in those problematic cases, other people would just answer one way or another, you know, making their judgments. Yeah, no, I, I found that really interesting. And that whole thing of enacting the guidance in terms of, you know, try the, the problems that you describe in the paper about visual identification of patients in order to, to follow the guidelines. Yeah. And in the later part of the paper, in the discussion section, you pursue Pollock's uh, work about uh, how practitioners close conceptual and socio-political uncertainties about race, race and ethnicity yeah. in order to act in their professional capacities. I, I wrote that down from, from the discussion. Um, and I just, um, what were the things that, that, that perhaps surprised you? I mean, you've, you've said some of the things um, about the way the people you spoke to uh, did not problematise something, that the minute you start scratching the surface, you realise it is highly problematic. But could you elaborate a bit on that argument about um, how that that um, closure happens? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I think the things I found surprising, were, you know, were also that, that you know, the, this idea that um, so, some practitioners would admit to eyeballing or you know um, making visual identifications of patients uh, in order to determine their race or, or ethnicity although that was a minority of the respondents that said that and they did seem to recognize that that might be considered problematic um, but also this idea that you know that there was this kind of inconsistency between what the guidelines uh, was saying that mixed race patients weren't supposed to be considered black patients but when we asked practitioners they would consider mixed race patients to be black and that you know what when we said, you know, are North African patients uh, considered black? No, they're not considered black. So there's this kind of inconsistency in what people are perceiving. Uh, and then, uh, I, and how they're understanding those um, ideas. But then you said, you know, how is it if we kind of are uh, following this idea of Pollock's about closing the uncertainties? I think, yeah, when, so as I understand it, when, when, and Pollock has you know, said that in Medicating Race. She was talking about the idea that race is inherently problematic as a category. It's scientifically problematic. It's socially problematic. Uh, and that when it's used in medicine, there, therefore those inherent scientific and socio-political problems become manifest. Which patients are going to be counted in which categories? Who's being discriminated against? Is a higher prevalence of the disease the result of cultural difference or socioeconomic inequality or relative differences in genetic ancestry or racism? You know, what, what is it that's kind of determining those? And, and you know, what she seems to be saying is that um, healthcare practitioners have a set of responsibilities to act, even if there are no clear resolutions to those intractable, intractable problems. And I think what we then tried to add um, to Anne Pollock's idea is that that there are various sources of authorities that get deployed by professionals when they try to close those uncertainties about debates about race. So, you know, we try to show that the prescribing guidelines are based not just on a body of science, but on weaving that science together with state bureaucracy in the form of the census classification scheme and people's common sense ideas about racial difference. And that means, you know, it's interlocking means that there's a kind of formidable racialized logic that normalizes racialized prescribing. You know, if the science is vague about what counts as black, then the state census is used. If the state census is unclear, then people fall back on common sense. And these things interweave with each other to, to create this racialization process. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I found that whole thing really, really powerful and it really provoked a lot of, of thinking for me. Um, as a sort of closing question, just for this section where we're focusing on your paper, um, I wondered what you thought about uh, the challenges for, perhaps for you next or for people doing research in this particular area. What What's the yeah. next step? Well, I mean, I guess, um, you know, we conclude that there are kind of um, uncertainties and risks that, get, that are uh, implicit in using racialized categories because of those scientific and socio-political uh, problems and therefore that those risks 
might be passed on in terms of the allocation of patients incorrectly to different groups, but also in terms of people's reactions to trying to you know, encourage people to use or not use racialized guidance. So we think there are kind of some problems to explore. Uh, but of course, our study was very small. It was a you know, qualitative, small number of interviews. So if I were doing it again, I'd want to know is that same, are those same things happening uh, with health professionals more routinely, not you know, non-experts, if you like, is this happening in other areas of medicine? Uh, but I think that the larger challenge with all of this is that what I, what I think we know is that there are both benefits and risks attached to using racialized categories in healthcare, and that the benefits are, you know, if differences exist between groups, it's, it's you know, an obligation, you know, ethically, um, medically, to address those differences so that those people aren't um, unequally treated. But then we know that there are all these problems in using racialized categories, okay? So what we have to do is somehow unpick this mess so that we, if, if racial and ethnic categories do need to be used, how can, you be done, how can that be done in a way that's effective and in a way that minimizes any potential harms? Yeah, and I, th and I think your paper's a really good provocation to that. So I hope, I hope people uh, will read it and engage with those. So thanks, thanks for that, Andy. And um, I'll turn now to Tarek and your paper with Shushra uh, Jadhav. Um, and I, reflecting on Andrew and, and Kate's paper made me think about the sort of micro level enactment of racist ideas in prescribing. And it made me think about my own assumptions about ethnic differences in disease and inequality. And um, that paper shocked me. Uh, although perhaps not as much as it should have done um, uh, when I first read it in the sense that on rereading it in the context of some of the debates recently, I could really see how sociologists need to up their game really when thinking critically about the social construction of race and to question these racialized uh, assumptions. Um, so I was shocked by, by their paper, but your paper when I read it, and I've shared it a lot since, um, made me feel sick. Um, and it's a great paper, and it's beautifully written. Uh, they both they're both lovely papers. But I, the content of your paper made me feel really angry and ashamed about the racism that you highlight in what to me is my beloved NHS, um, and. So your paper is, is a study of, it's an ethnographic study of the UK's national uh, counter radicalization policy that's called PREVENT, which many of us know in our universities because we're also meant to implement this policy that imposes on us and on the NHS a duty to uh, prevent radicalization um, and put that in quote marks. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what was the impetus behind this study? Uh, why, why did you want to lift the lid on this issue? Mm -hmm. um, so I think this study came from, it was sort of a, it coalesced from many different trajectories that, you know, sort of overlapped at one time. Um, my research background was um, on Islamophobia, really. I was, um, uh, especially for my PhD, I looked at Islamophobia across um, across countries and how the uh, the social conflict um, that's embodied in the war on terror, among other uh, you know among other sort of uh, social conflicts, how Muslims are portrayed and and uh, you know how they experience Islamophobia differently. So I think there was there's there's a point that has to be said about okay we're talking about race and racism. I mean, how do we even understand race and racism? And I think I always like to begin with that because, um, you know, someone who's listening might have a conception of race or racism. Um, but, you know, just to maybe, maybe just to say quite blunt, bluntly, at least from my perspective, one of the ways we can understand how racism operates is that certain people, certain bodies uh, embody or reflect Certain, uh, certain certain social conflict in in, uh, in in the public consciousness. So if we think about the war on drugs and the fear of um, uh, that's associated with criminality, how you know black black communities embody this um, you know this this social conflict. And the war on terror is just another one of them. 
Um, and so I think there's an element of these social conflicts, public consciousness, as well as the rise of nationalism, which we're seeing across Europe, we're seeing across North America, which in a way provides a foundation. I mean, we're thinking about nationalism, we're actually often thinking and talking about ethno-nationalism. A lot of research has really unpacked that. So for me, it was really interesting to see, well, here's a policy that's taking a very uh, highly, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a racist uh, enterprise, the war on terror. And it's, it's now uh, issuing it as, as a public duty. Um, and it becomes then fascinating to see how that um, unfolds. Um, I think there's other elements, I think, as, as it stands, um, you know, a lot, uh, a lot of um, discourse around the side disciplines in particular, but healthcare, you know, they see themselves or they see healthcare as an apolitical space. So that also became very fascinating to me because it's really important to recognize that PREVENT was introduced very arbitrarily in the NHS um, in 2011. It was basically, you know, a question was asked, well, why aren't doctors doing more? You know, why, 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 why can't we involve doctors and, you know, uh, nurses, et cetera, to, to play a, you know, a larger role? And it had a, it had this, um, you know, this data logic to it that if we have more people playing a role in being able to identify free criminals, then, um, you know, that's, that's for the better. So it's sort of that CSA sorted logic that we hear often in, in London uh, public transport. Um, so it was, it was introduced very arbitrarily, this sort of policy, um, sorry, uh, it's a policy that precedes evidence. Um, and now I thought, oh, well, given all of this, you know, we're thinking about how Muslims are often portrayed as sort of the slow death of Europe, especially as it comes to threat, aggressiveness, etc. Now you have a policy that just, you know, inserted through documents, through training. Um, and I was then, I thought this was a great opportunity to see how Muslims are racialized uh, through counter-radicalization in, in clinical practice. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll get on to some of the, the data that you found in a, in a minute because it's, it, it's um, you know, very, very shocking uh, what you found um, and really gets, gets to grips with this uh, deep Islamophobia that, that uh, underpins all of this. Um, but one of the things in your paper, because it's an ethnography and um, be, because of your engagement with the field, one of the things that I really liked in your paper was the way that you reflect on your own experiences in the research journey. Um, and I think that may well be because I'm an ethnographer too, so I like to hear that other people struggle with these things and, and think about that. And I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about your uh, your learning points, really, in terms of the, the challenges of doing this research for you as a researcher? Yeah. I mean, I'll be frank, it was it was um, it was really quite a struggle. Um, it wasn't something I I, I I thought it would be a struggle already. But the, the issue with counterterrorism in and of itself, we already know um, is a highly moralizing enterprise as well. Right. As George Bush said, you're either with us or against us. There's really that that fine line it's very easy to cross. Um, and so I think throughout the research process, I felt that sort of heightened sense of insecurity myself. You know, um, even uh, politicians such as Sajid Javid would kind of like hint at, oh, there's these academic slash activists who are aiding extremists, you know, in like in their work. Um, and I think that, you know, as much as I perhaps would like to have this veneer that, oh, you know, I'm not phased by such rhetoric. Yeah, I, I think it still has this effect on me. And of course it has then effect on a field. I mean, I've, I've written a lot in terms of this, in terms of my own sort of autoethnography when it comes to uh, researching this. But I've had people, racialized Muslims, especially in healthcare. I mean, I mentioned that I'm researching prevent or whatever it might be, um, and even in a sort of slightly critical tone, um, you know, people would just walk away from me or, you know, they would send me a message later and say, sorry, I don't want to engage in politics. So it's very, very moralizing. And you feel, yeah. feel it immediately um, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this domain. Um, 
I think other things, other challenges, you know, I think the healthcare staff that I spoke with, I, I published another article that talks about sort of the ethical moral distress that staff experience going to prevent training, you know, um, so a racialized Muslim uh, staff member. It doesn't necessarily have to be racialized Muslim, it can be also racialized white who has a problem with prevent and then they're told immediately to, you know, one, one uh, psychologist question why they're being trained uh, in prevent and someone else turned towards them and said, shh, we're just trying to save lives. You know, so you immediately she's like, oh, you know, what, what's going on here? Suddenly, you know, you can imagine the space was experienced quite differently for her. Um, and I think the NHS has yet to really capture that ethical or moral distress. This is sort of an emerging theme, but I, I felt among staff, sure, they might have an idea that they can go complain somewhere or someone to talk to, but really there's really no one, you know, to really share that distress with. And it can be very quite distressing, you know, to um, feel like you have to enact a policy or you have a duty upon yourself that you might uh, experience as racist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it, you know it's 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 not a comfortable area of research and it's not a comfortable area of practice. I mean that really that really comes across. Um, one of one of the bits in your paper, with your permission, I'll just um, quote from a little bit of it. Um, there's there's an account of a, one of the psychiatrists that you interviewed, uh, um, Hamza, who's a, a racialized Muslim male psychiatrist, um, who sort of admits to agreeing with the spirit of the prevent sort of policy. Um, but then changed his view uh, in relation to a specific patient here called Michael. And Michael has, um, you describe, it's, it has shared, a, and I'll quote from the paper here, um, an extraordinary disdain for the homeless. Hamza explained that Michael had a series of aggressive encounters with homeless individuals in the past, in one instance leading to assault. Michael's resentment of the homeless indicated he might do so again in the future. And for Hamza, Michael's aggression, not indicative of an imminent threat of violence, nor devoid of its potential, seemed like a perfect fit for prevent, not least because the demonization of homelessness was clearly an ideological artifact associated with no neoliberalism. Um, and so you describe, and it's just that it really brings out the tensions for me, the way that, that Hamza tries to make Michael a candidate for this, you know, this person is vulnerable to radicalization, but is also a threat to other people. Um, and he's basically told by the safeguarding lead for the trust that, no, 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 that it's not for that kind of person. Um, and I just, um, wanted to ask you to just perhaps share with us some more about this, the way that this, you know, we're getting it everywhere in the media, we're getting it in, in this kind of policy, this, it, it, this uh, you know, Muslim equals terrorist, and the ways that white violence, and, you know, we've seen huge examples of white violence particularly in, in relation to, as I mentioned at the beginning, George Floyd, um, why why one is suitable for referral and one is not? I And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about this, I think. I mean, this is sort of going down the rabbit hole uh, of white innocence. And I think it just shows how um, whiteness serves as the sort of normative uh, framework uh, by which then other things are um, assessed. Um, you know, I think to, to, to say it in a nutshell, you know, white people do get referred to prevent, but their bodies, their behaviors alone, often, um, you know, they're privileged in the sense that their bodies and behaviors alone do, doesn't conjure that, that, uh, that, uh, that point of threat in people's uh, imagination. And I think, again, this, is, this has to do that we live in a racialized society and there are racial hierarchies. And then according to social conflicts, you know, certain bodies are going to, you know, they're going to conjure these threats or, you know, certain ideas such as criminality, backwardness, regressiveness, et cetera, differently. And, you know, when you, this point has to be also taken, um, the Hamza's point, or Hamza's case rather, 
has to be taken, I think, with maybe like two other three points at the same time. So you have to consider then how how are racialized Muslims then referred, right? So I brought up the case example of you know someone who just came in with a long garb and you know uh, a beard and you know a GP was wondering, oh, um, he wants to homeschool, you know, uh, his children. Is this a prevent referral? You know, and so there, if you if you put those two side by side. You know, you see how the significance of racialization is so important when we're discussing this. But I've, there's so many other cases. I mean, there's cases of women putting on their headscarf, uh, you know, uh, someone going on Hajj and mentioning that. Or even when it comes to uh, certain, it's like, let's say, Islamic um, you know, rhetoric, someone is talking about jihad very broadly or even speaking against it, things like that. You know, people often get referred almost for the most banal things. So I think this element of white innocence is um, is is really really significant. And the point I'm always I'm always trying to raise that it's not a it's, it's not actually about how Muslims are racialized. We actually have to flip that coin. It's about whiteness as embedded within systems, because this whole point of war on terror it it affects. Uh, you know, non-white people of color, such as, uh, you know, black people in the war on drugs, war on gangs, the war on knives, it affects them in exactly the same way. And we saw that just, you know, a few days ago where, you know, um, uh, uh, Jacob was shot seven times in the U.S. With, uh, by the police. And at the same, uh, the next day at a protest, there's, uh, you know, a youth, 17 years old, walking with an assault rifle. Um, and he's just walking towards the cops after having shot two, three people. And he's walking to hand himself in. Um, and, you know, I think this element of white innocence is actually really quite significant because that's what brings out the fact that we've been a racialized system. Yeah, and I think one of the things that your paper provokes me to think about was the, was the stuff that you write about the performance of colorblindness in this policy, but it made me reflect on the performance of color blindness in you know my my own life and and the need to understand what the privilege of the white skin confers on me as a white woman um, and and how I am able to move through the world and through my professional life in a way that is very very different and and you've got some some um, shocking but important examples in your paper from from the data that that you collected. Um, and one of the things that I've been reading um, Ibram uh, Kendi's uh, stuff about how to, how to practice anti-racism, and uh, he particularly encourages us not to talk anymore about institutionalised racism and instead to talk about racist policies and racist practices, because that's what we've got to change. Um, and if we can get away from the idea that, oh, well, it's all structural, so what can we do? Actually, we can do something about policy and we can do something about practice. Now, I'll take it as a given that we'd like to see the prevent policy abolished. Um, but I wondered if, if we were going to use this opportunity of this conversation to say to um, our current government or to Matt Hancock or to the NHS, here's a thing you could do. What what would what would be a response that you think the NHS could make to the challenges that you've identified? Um, I think uh, I, I think as you mentioned, you know, I think Ibrahim Kendi focuses on policy, and I think that's really really important. Um, as we know right now, the Black Lives Matter movement has um, reinvigorated calls towards anti-racism, but a lot of this is posturing. There's a lot of platitudes that are given, or at least mentioned, you know, explicitly. Um, but then, in practice, are often reduced to questions of diversity, you know, uh, or or like racial awareness training. Um, and I think it's always significant whenever those points are raised to always bring it back to looking at those policies. We're we're looking at institutions, you know, we're looking at the police as an institution. We're looking at, you know. Uh, structures such as policy, such as prevent, such as hostile environment, you know, so many of these structures um, which really need to be interrogated, which are maintained often uh, with points of privilege, with points of uh, innocence of saying, oh, well, we're doing this with the best of intentions. And so, you know, it's 
it ends up in inevitably always being questions of diversity and training. And I think it's really always important to 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 uh, to be very critical of that and, um, you know, to cut away from points of um, thinking about racism as uh, as hostile intentions, as 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 um, you know, expressions that come from the margins of society, but really think about it as very normative uh, prejudices, which uh, exist in public consciousness. And institutional racism is when those are legitimized through uh, through policies and through structures. And I think it's really important to hit that that point of legitimization, where someone can have a pre prejudicial, um, you know, attitude in any way, shape, or form. Um, and that might happen, but the institution itself cannot legitimize it. Uh, and I think that's where, um, especially given that public discourse is often overtly xenophobic or Islamophobic, things like that, right? So, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's even, the imperative is even higher to make sure that there's no policy that's legitimizing that sort of normative uh, political discourse. Yeah, thank you. Um, so obviously we've only skated over the surface of these papers um, and I just, a couple of closing questions. I, I, I thought I'd give you the opportunity just to reflect on some of the wider reverberations of Black Lives Matter, justice activism and recent events on you and your work. And I thought I'd just quickly ask you, is there something that you've read or seen or attended that you would share with the people uh, watching this uh, that you would encourage them to, to to visit alongside perhaps your papers. So, Andy, is there something that you want to tell us about? Uh, um, I have been turning my attention to, unsurprisingly, to anti-racism and racism in, in the last year or so. And I came across, there was a special issue uh, about anti-racism in ethnic and racial studies, which has got some really great papers in it. Uh, and really uh, opened my, uh, you know, gave, gave me a lot of awareness about um, anti-racist practices and, you know, um, um, the ways in which those are changing and the problems in trying to impose them. Uh, also more theoretical stuff about, you know, what, what, can, what is racism, anti-racism, when they're, you know, standing alongside claims of post-racial society, how can we understand those things working together? Um, I, I, and, you know, this... Uh, talked to a lot of things that you know, have just been discussed. So I think that that's, that's really, uh, imp that's been uh, uh, gaining uh, importance for me. And at the same time, I've been, um, you know, watching, listening to debates about, um, you know, uh, healthcare professionals seeing it on the news about uh, racist discrimination towards healthcare professionals from, you know, from members of the public, but also from the institutions uh, that they're working in. So I'm finding that you know, that whole body of literature, there's kind of a lot of literature out there, particularly around mainly overseas nurses or internationally trained nurses about experiences of racism. Um, uh, and that's, you know, a 20-year body of work which is showing that's going on. And interestingly, it speaks to this idea that there are policies and practices in place about equality which just aren't working. And if they're not working, why is it that they're not working? And what can we learn from the new stuff on anti-racism that might be able to address the well-known problems in a much more effective yes. way. So in, um, you know, Matt Hancock, you mentioned him just recently, said that a zero tolerance approach should be taken uh, to racism in the NHS, of pa patients asking for uh, white doctors over non-white doctors. But those policies exist and they're not being implemented. So what is going on and what can be changed so that those uh, so that those policies that do exist can be implemented more effectively. I think that's what, where I'm interested in going. Yeah. My work. Thanks, Andy. And Tarek, what about you? Your top tip? Um, yeah, I I think uh, there's quite there's quite a number of things. Um, you know, I think it's really important to consider um, sort of the digital world, digital surveillance, and the, the, the significance of racism as encoded in algorithms, etc. Um, you know, we're thinking about gang matrices, things like that. I think this is sort of the future that um, many people really have to consider in, in when we're talking about anti-racism. But in terms, I guess, of a, of one piece of uh, of work, uh, I recently watched um, a show called Plot Against America. It's an HBO show, uh, miniseries, six episodes, written by, uh, uh, created by David Simon, who did The Wire. 
Um, and it's a really, really fantastic show. Uh, it takes place in um, in sort of uh, an alternate, or I guess it's basically uh, 1940s America, whereby you know ethno-nationalism has has gone on the rise. And before before it becomes sort of a national issue that oh, you know, a lot of people are now racist and are it's it has that political legitimacy. The show actually focuses on this Jewish family and the experiences that they have, the sort of the, the sort of affect of it. You know, the mother, she's she's already worried, she's already thinking about her children, she's already thinking about leaving, and it precedes the the sort of a global, you, you, not necessarily global, but sort of the explicit discussions that people have. And I think that sort of experiential element is often um, overlooked. And I think one of the projects I'm really interested in is the point of affective surveillance. That people feel like, you know, they're, they're, they're being watched, you know, they're constantly um, thinking about uh, what they say and how, how they say it, expressing their emotions, especially when it comes to anger in anti-racism. And that show is really fantastic at highlighting that progression, I think, with the family. Um, so I can definitely recommend it. It's called Plotting. Okay, thank you. I, I love it when people also give me, you know, programs that I can watch. And I, it's like, yay, I'm allowed to watch, you know, do that thing of kind of uh, just binge watching a whole series. Uh, anyway, so thank you, Tarek. Um, thanks very much to um, both of you. So thank you, um, Andy Smart and Tarek Yunis, for having this conversation today about your papers in SHI that are now free to uh, read in the collection on race and ethnicity research. Um, and thank you also to your co-authors, uh, Kate and Shushrut. Um, I'd like to also just briefly thank the BSA and Wiley, our publisher, for their support in making this event possible, uh, and to the conveners of BSA MedSoc for giving us this space. Uh, I encourage anyone that's watched this to read the two papers that we've been talking about today um, and delve into the collection that we've put together, um, because I really hope that we can use this in medical sociology, in the sociology of health and illness, to learn, to inform our debates and have conversations and above all to answer those calls for justice and anti-racist practice. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. There we are. Right. Well done. I